Family, this is your season for wise moves. You know, you're probably thinking, PD, every season is my season for wise, wise moves. Of course. But I think it's biblically naive not to recognize that some seasons are more consequential than others. Sons of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel ought to do. There are certain seasons where your margin of error is less. And I don't know when that season is for you. You have to discern that with the help of the Holy Spirit. But I know I'm in one of those seasons. And for many of you, you're in that same season. Your decisions are way more consequential. You need to know how to move with not earthly wisdom, street smarts, common sense, what grandmama told me, but with heavenly wisdom. And I'm not saying everything that I've learned from parents or family is unscriptural. I'm saying I got to put it through the filter of scripture to make sure it passed that test. Because if I want a next level life, I got to live with next level wisdom. That's what this sermon is all about. Now, I've got one request. If it helps you, I want you to send it to somebody else. That's it. Text it. Text the link and help somebody else. I love you. Enjoy the message. Today, I teach in series. That means I take a character from the Bible, I take a book of the Bible or a theme from the Bible, and I spend several weeks explaining it and attempting to show how this applies to our everyday life. Um, last month, we were in the book of Nahum, and we did a series called A Letter to My Enemies on how to handle yourself when you've been mishandled by others. This month, we're in the book of Proverbs from a series called I'm Too Smart for This. And I want us to go to the book of Proverbs chapter 4, beginning at verse number 5. And here's what Solomon says. He says, get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. Do y'all, do you, uh, look at Pastor. You see him using the word she? Because the Bible is filled with poetic imagery and some even hyperbole. Like in the New Testament, Jesus said, if your hand offend you, cut it off. Do you really think? He means cut your hand off physically. Come on, wave at me, wave at me. No, no, that, that's not, he, he's saying, hey, do whatever you gotta do to protect yourself from you. So here in Proverbs chapter four, what Solomon is doing is he's using the imagery of a woman to describe wisdom. So he says, do not forsake wisdom. She will protect you. Love her. She will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Cherish her and she will exalt you. Embrace her. She will honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. I'm going to stop the reading of scripture from there, and I want to use the series subject as a subject for this sermon today. Quite simply, I'm too smart for this. Clap your hands, 1145. You ready for the word? Too smart for this. I want to leap into this lesson with a question. It's a rhetorical question, a question for your reflection, and it's simply this. Have you ever felt like your place didn't match your potential? In other words, have you felt like there's a gap between where you are and where you could be, what you have and what you want, or what you're doing and what you've been called to do? Have you ever looked at who you are, where you are, and what you're doing and concluded, I'm too smart for this? Things are not bad, but they're not great. Things are better than they used to be, but I know they're not as good as they can be. I'm too smart for this. If this is your sentiment and your story, then there's a question that begs to be asked and answered. And the question is simply this. When you find yourself in a season or a situation where your place and your potential don't match, what do you do? And this is a question that needs to be explored because there is a human tendency to work harder. 
And although there is a place for hard work and the Bible advocates for hard work, you can hit a season where hard work doesn't work. As one of my mentors puts it, hard work only works when you're working hard at the right thing. And I want to know, is there anybody in the room, anybody online that understands how frustrating it is to be working hard on something that's not working? Very little is more frustrating than to be working hard on the relationship and the hard work isn't working. To be working hard in the career and the hard work isn't working. To be working hard spiritually and the hard work isn't working. To be working hard trying to start something or scale something and the hard work isn't working. This family leads us to this axiom that needs to be embraced and understood by all of us under the sound of my voice. There are some situations and scenarios that are not addressed by working harder. Some situations and some scenarios require working higher. (laughs) Working harder is using willpower. Working higher is using wisdom and wisdom will work when willpower won't this is family the essence of what solomon articulates in a book of the bible called ecclesiastes ecclesiastes 10 10 says if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened more strength is needed but skill will bring success see the issue isn't working harder if my axe is dull come on no matter how much i swing and how much energy i exert how much effort i extend swinging the axe may cause me to sweat but it doesn't cause the tree to fall if I want trees to fall I've got to do more than swing my axe I've got to sharpen my axe and I just want to pause for the calls and say this to somebody at the 1145 service because it may have prophetic implications for some of you. This is your season, not of swinging. This is your season of sharpening. Come on. All 2024, you've been swinging and the tree's still standing. 2023, you've been swinging and the tree's still standing. But I want to know, am I talking for, to anybody that's ready for some trees to fall? I said, are you ready for some trees in your mind to fall? Some trees in your relationship to fall. Some trees in your career to fall. Some trees in your home to fall. Well, if I'm ready for trees to fall, I've got to do more than swing my axe. I've got to sharpen my axe. I've got to do more than work harder. I've got to work higher. And this is why we ought to thank and praise God for books of the Bible like Proverbs. I love every book of the Bible. I love Jeremiah. I love Daniel. I love Ezekiel. I love Zechariah. I love Zephaniah. I love Obadiah. I love Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I thank God for a section of the Bible called wisdom literature that contains books of the Bible like Proverbs because Proverbs is situated in a section of the Bible called wisdom literature. Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, and Job. And the purpose of these books of the Bible is to impart wisdom to the godly. It is is God's way of saying that the life I intended for humans to live cannot just be accomplished by living righteously. They must also live wisely. Am I making sense here? I said, am I making sense here? So the book of Proverbs is this collection of content that is curated primarily by this successful sage named Solomon. And this book is intended to impart wisdom to the godly. Solomon, one of the wisest men to ever live. Solomon, a life whose example, that the, who is an example that the circumstances you come out of don't have to determine what you turn out like because Solomon came out of unfavorable circumstances. And I, I'm not gonna have time, I'm, I don't wanna, but let me just bother, okay. Yeah, he, his father was a man by the name of David who defeated Goliath. 
You okay? His mother, I'm just going to say her name and get back to my business, was a woman named Bathsheba. So in Proverbs 31, when Solomon uses the word Lemuel as a euphemism for himself and says in Proverbs 31, when I say who shall find, who can find a virtuous woman, when Solomon says, I'm writing what my mama told me. Listen to this. His life reveals, listen to this, that the womb doesn't have to be your ruin. The womb represents a set of circumstances that you came out of but aren't in control of. And I don't know what womb you've come out of in a previous season. It could be the womb of divorce, the womb of a breakdown, the womb of grief, the womb of a failed deal, but what you come out of doesn't control how you turn out. Solomon ends up being one of the wisest men who ever lived, but he's the result of one of the unwisest decisions ever made <laughs> and out of all the people that God could have picked to be king he picked Solomon and Solomon gets this assignment to be the successor to his father David and this assignment creates a degree of healthy imposter syndrome because it's one thing if you're David to succeed Saul. It's another thing if you're Solomon to succeed David. Saul was a very dysfunctional leader. And so when you're coming behind dysfunction, you don't even have to be good. You just gotta be not dysfunctional. But Solomon's coming behind David. And David is legendary. David is iconic. And Solomon has enough self-awareness to know just because I grew up in the palace doesn't mean I know how to run one. So when he steps into this assignment, he feels a little overwhelmed. And some people can look at this gap between what Solomon is called to do and how Solomon feels about his adequacy and they could call Solomon insecure. I don't believe that just because you're questioning your capability to do a thing that God's called you to do means you're insecure. I think some things that God calls you to do are beyond you. Come on here. Yes. I believe that there are some things that God calls you to do that are beyond you because he wants to assign you something that doesn't require him. And so when I look at what he's calling me to do and I say to myself, I can't do it, God's like, exactly, without me. And the reason I picked you is because I know you can't do it without me and you know you can't do it without me and you won't be arrogant enough to try to do it without me. Come on here. I could take you throughout scripture and I could show you examples of when God called a person to do a thing and that person expressed their inadequacy. God never argued about the inadequacy, but God gave them a solution that would make up for it. When Moses said, I'm slow of speech, he said, don't worry about it, I'm sending Aaron. He didn't deny that Moses had the inadequacy. He said, I'm gonna fill it with my assistance. Am I making, I don't know who this is for, but let me just tell somebody at the 1145, help is on the way. Wherever there's a gap between what you can do and what you've been called to do, God's letting you know I'm a gap filler that I left the gap there intentionally. I don't need you to fill in the gap. I'm gonna fill in the gap because I won't call you to do something that doesn't require me. Our gift is what God uses.
it is not God. And God's like, as, you, as gifted as you are, your gift is limited in how far it can take you. But I left the gap between what you're called to do and what you're able to do because I'm gonna fill in the gap. Help is on the way. I said help's 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 on the way. Sooner or later, it'll turn in my favor. He's turning it around for me. Help. This is what happens with Solomon. He steps into this role. He's got some trepidation. He got some trepidation, so he engages in this generous act of worship. And let me see how I can say this. He engages in this generous act of worship, and I want everybody at every location not to shout. (laughs) Right here. Don't shout. Don't shout at Global. Don't shout at Gwinnett. Nobody nobody shout. Because Solomon makes this, this generous, he engages in this radical act of generosity. And in verse 5, here's what happens. He's timid. He's, he, he's wondering whether or not he can accomplish the assignment. And he engages in this act of radical generosity. And God comes to him and asks him something. Now, God's never asked me this, but if he asks me this, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> if he asks me this, I don't have an answer. I got a list. If he asks, now, now, don't you shout unless you want God to ask you this one day. God appears to Solomon during the night in a dream. And God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. Don't you shout in here. Don't you clap. Don't you rejoice unless you're waiting on verse 5 to come to your address. Here's what he says. Ask me for whatever you want. It's not a reckless, it's not a reckless invitation. He's vetted the person that he's extending this invitation to because everybody can't be trusted with that question. So he's vetted Solomon and says, I trust you enough to manage a request like this properly. And Solomon's answer reveals why he could be trusted with the question. Watch what Solomon says. He says, you've shown shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he's faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and giving him a son to sit on the throne this very day. Oh, if I had time. Woo! The degree of character that's seen in the question. A man who could have entitlement. A man who could say, I'm here because I deserve to be here. But he's saying, but I'm not here because of your kindness to me. I'm not here because of your fondness of me. I'm here because of your fondness to my father. Y'all missing it? I want you to get the metaphor. I'm not here because of me. I'm here because of my father. You missing the metaphor? I'm not here because of me. I'm here because I had a good father. You're missing the metaphor. I'm not where I am because I'm good. I'm where I am because my father's good. He was talking about an earthly father. Our testimony is a heavenly father. I am where I am because my father has been good to me. Notice what he says. He says, he says, he says, now, now, Lord my God, You've made your servant, gosh, I don't have time. You've made your servant king. Me being king, me gaining king, doesn't mean I lose servant. (laughs) 
I'm serving through the office of a king. Notice what it says. In place of my father David, but I'm only a little child. I'm young and I don't know how to carry out my duties. I'm inexperienced. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen, a great people, too numerous to count a number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, or the death of your enemies, thank God for Nahum, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. He says, I'm gonna give you such a wise heart that you will be wiser than everybody that came before you and wiser than everyone that will come after you. Now I'm gonna read verse 13 because I gotta keep going here. I got a long way to go in 10 minutes and 56 seconds to get there. Here it is, here it is. But when I read verse 13, don't you shout. Don't you clap unless you want God to say this to you too. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for. <laughs> I'm going to give you what you asked for, and I'm going to give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. I want you to see this. I said, God said, I'm gonna give you so much wisdom that it's going to distinguish you from, some, from everyone else. And I want you to see this. The wisdom that he gave for Solomon, uh, gave to Solomon was wisdom he gave to Solomon, but not for Solomon. It's almost as if God's saying, okay, there are gonna be people that are at Change Church or watching Change Church in 2024 who are gonna hit a season where they realize I have to work higher. Now, someone would argue, Pastor, we should operate in wisdom in every season. Of course we should. But it's also biblically naive to assume that some seasons are not more consequential than others. There are certain seasons where the margin of error is smaller. And then there are certain seasons where the implications of your decisions are greater. Did you hear what I just said? If I got to fighting, and I'm not, but if I got to fighting with someone in the parking lot in 2004, that's one thing. If I get to fighting with somebody in the parking lot now, in 2024, leading change church, stewarding the responsibility that I'm stewarding, the implications of that decision not only affect me, it affects everyone connected. Come on. There are seasons that are more consequential than others. And God knows that we will be in seasons that were more consequential than others. So he had the wisdom that he gave Solomon. He said, it's like he's saying, Solomon, I gave this to you, but I didn't just uh, uh, give it to you for you. I gave it to you for others. So I want you to take the best of what you've learned and put it in poetic statements called proverbs or truisms. Hmm. And I want you to document it so that people can get it when they can't get you. So this book of proverbs is a collection of sayings primarily curated by this wise man named Solomon. It's as if God is saying the life I intend for my people to live cannot be experienced independent of this wisdom. Listen to this. Because your anointing and your gifting helps you improve other people's life. Wisdom helps you improve yours. 
I'm not anointed for me. You're not anointed for you. You're not gifted for you. Come on here. No tree eats its own fruit. The fruit that you produce is for others. The anointing does it for others. Wisdom does it for you. Hi-ya-ya. And this is our season for many of us to become better stewards of you. This isn't selfishness. This is stewardship. At some point, you ought to get sick of everybody else eating your fruit and you're hungry. Come on. I need wisdom. So Solomon here helps us. It's an entire book dedicated to wisdom. And here's what he says in verse chapter 4, verse 7. This is so powerful. He says, the beginning of wisdom is this. Because somebody's like, PD, where do I start? The beginning of wisdom is this. PD, I don't know where to begin. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. I want to be wise. Get it. <laughs> the revelation is in the word get. That which elevates our life rarely comes into our life automatically. It must be pursued intentionally. Get wisdom. Pastor, where do I get wisdom? Wherever there's a wisdom deficit. Well, pastor, how do I know where there's a wisdom deficit? Wherever there's a pattern of self-induced stress or a pattern of unnecessary pain, there's a wisdom deficit. Are y'all processing or are you resisting? Now I'm trying to... Okay. <laughs> I said, where's there's an absence of wisdom? I'm not talking about an absence of knowledge. Where's there's an absence of wisdom? There's a, wherever there's a pattern of self-induced stress, Self-induced suffering. Suffering that didn't come from life lifing, but suffering that comes from me meing. Let me go to this side over here. This isn't life lifing, this is me meing. What happened? Me. <laughs> what happened? Me. Lord, deliver me. Me. Self-induced suffering. Yeah. Self-sabotage of pain, there's a wisdom. To, and Solomon says, get it. Get it. Be intentional about it. He says, be so serious about it, though it costs you all you have. Be willing to invest the time and the energy and the effort to get wisdom. But notice what he says here. I love this. He says, get wisdom now. Here's where we need to park our car. Because when Solomon says wisdom, the question we got to ask is, what does he mean? Does that make sense? So here's what we don't want to do. Because we rob ourselves of the revelation of the richness of the Bible when we do this. When we assume, when I see a word, the person who wrote it means what I mean when I say it. Because here's what happens. If I think Solomon means what I mean when I say wisdom, when I'll see that scripture, I'll think that doesn't apply to me. I don't need that. I'm already wise, PD. I got that. But what, what does Solomon mean here? Because the Bible teaches that all wisdom is the same. Did you know the Bible teaches there are two types of wisdom? Pastor, where'd you get that from? The Bible. In James chapter 3, there are two types of wisdom James mentions. James chapter 3, verse 15 says, Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. This is called earthly wisdom. Don't get quiet on me now, church. I, need, I got three minutes. I need all your amens here. <laughs> earthly wisdom is characterized by human reasoning, logic, and it is wisdom that is based on the words and experiences of people, but it is absent of input from God. It is wisdom that comes from the words of people. It's meaning the wisdom that comes from words I've heard others say. 
words I've read, podcasts I've listened to, conversations I've had, courses I've taken, come on, sermons I've listened to. Okay? People I love. People that love me. Or experiences I've had. Meaning I go through a traumatic experience. I come out of that experience with a life philosophy that I feel like protects me. Are y'all still here? Here's the problem. That's not the way the Bible defines wisdom. Because that, that kind of wisdom may work temporarily. But just because something works doesn't mean it's right. Huh? Am I making sense? So someone can tell you, hey, this is how you handle a man. Or someone tell you, this is how you handle a woman. And you try it and it works. And we can assume whatever works is right. But if we go, let's, let's use the Old Testament for an example. Before Moses led Israel out of the ex, in an exodus out of Egypt, he has this exchange in front of Pharaoh. And the Bible says he, there's this rod. He throws a rod down and turns to a snake. Pharaoh's magicians throw their rod down. It turns to a snake. So prophecy and sorcery. It could be like, oh my God. When she said what she said, it was so right. But here's what the Bible, oh my, my, my. But the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto man. But in the end, ultimately, eventually, inevitably, it leads to destruction. No, PD, I got that from my grandmama. Fine. But did you put it through the filter? Did you put it through the filter of the word? Because if not, it's earthly. And this series is a shifting series. I believe what God wants to do in this series is shift us from operating with earthly wisdom to heavenly wisdom. Pastor, what is heavenly wisdom? In Matthew chapter number seven, verse 24, Jesus says, therefore whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. So for Jesus, whoever hears these words of mine, it's the of mine. You got it? It's the of mine. Not just who hears some words. Not just who hear words that make sense. Not just who hears words that speak to me. It just spoke to me. Just spoke to me. No, these words of mine. And puts them into practice. So the wisdom gap is the, the wisdom, excuse me, is what fills the gap between information and application. The person, watch this, how real can pastor be? I'm on this 45. I just want to know how real can I be at this service? Okay, every service is different, so I don't want to, you know, I won't go too far, but how, how, how y'all, you, can I? You benefit not from the sermon you hear. You benefit from the sermon you apply. Yes, sir. Where'd you get that from? The Bible. I got it from the Bible. Don't just be hearer of the word. Listen to this. And so deceive yourself. That's the book. It means that when you hear something that is profound, and provocative is stimulate something on the inside of you that you can be, de be deceived into thinking something's changed. 
It means that word is right on time. A timeless truth delivered in a timely manner. It's right on time. And it is exactly what I need to hear. Exactly when I need to hear it. And I just feel so much better. And I feel so much freer not realizing that what you're feeling is fleeting, episodic, and temporary. You feel better, but nothing gets better until you put it into practice. And so many people have defected from the faith saying that the faith doesn't work. And the issue isn't whether or not the faith works. The issue is whether or not you're working the faith right. I don't want to know how many notes you have. What did you apply? I don't want to know how many sermons you heard. What did you apply? Let's go, Tario. We out of time. This is heavenly wisdom. James 3.17. The wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. See, earthly wisdom can be manipulative and exploitive. It's like, like it's wise, come on, it's like wise from an earthly perspective, you gotta be wise to manipulate somebody. Come on, to scam, you gotta be wise. Let's not act like all scamming doesn't work. It works. Some of it works. But it's earthly wisdom. Unspiritual. Inconsiderate. Exploitive. Manipulative. And it seems right. But in the end. That's the way that seems. But in the end. No, no, Pastor. I'm wise in my relationships. I'm not questioning that. My question is what wisdom are you using? No, I got this from my cousin. They've been married 40 years. And did you put it through the filter of the sayings of Jesus? Because heavenly wisdom has promises attached to it that earthly wisdom doesn't. And these promises are in Proverbs. Number one, heavenly wisdom has the promise of protection attached to it. Verse six, do not forsake wisdom, she will protect you. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Do not forsake wisdom. Wisdom will, the, the presence of wisdom reduces the need for miracles. We will always need miracles, but it is one thing to periodically need miracles versus living our life in a way where there's a pattern where I always need miracles for everything. Wisdom protects, protects my mind, protects my relationship, protects my heart, protects my name good name, more precious, more valuable than rubies, wisdom, protection. Number two, wisdom brings promotion. Wisdom from above, cherish her and she will what? Exalt you. That the increase of wisdom inevitably leads to increase of opportunity. Because wise people can't stay hidden. (laughs) <laughs> come on here now here's when we talk about promotion right I want to use two biblical frameworks for you I want to use Old Testament frameworks king and king makers here's what I've really been praying for in this season and later in this series I'm going to introduce you to uh, a New Testament character named Cornelius because I got this concept last week called the Cornelius calling 
that I want to introduce you to. But when I talk about promotion, very often people think about like job promotion, or they may think about career promotion. Maybe they think about like becoming what we would call a king. Uh, influential, known, front-facing, the face of a thing. Well, in the Bible, there's, you got kings, but what was more significant than kings were king makers. These were people that are actually wiser than kings. But they weren't called to be in the front. They were called to be behind the person that is in the front. Y'all missed it. And very often they were greater in spiritual stature and wisdom than the person that was in the front. So Esther was a queen. But the queen maker was Mordecai. There's a whole book written about Esther that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a kingmaker named Mordecai who say, I'm wise enough to help you be a queen, but I'm humble enough not to have to be in the palace. Kingmaker. John the Baptist, so secure in his assignment that he says, my assignment is to decrease. So that he may increase. Boy, if I had time. Number three. Preservation. Wisdom will preserve you in what you didn't get protected from. You ever, you ever been in something and then you're like, uh, man. You thought about it once you're in it. You're like, man, I wish I thought about this. Uh, before I got in this. <laughs> but I'm in it now. It's no sense in revisiting what I can't revise. It's no sense in punishing myself over past I can't change. I'm in it now. Wisdom helps you preserve yourself in what you couldn't protect yourself from. A minute, and he's going to help me get out. I got myself into it, but he's God enough to help me get out of it. The story of the gospel is a story of the second Adam getting us out of a mess that the first Adam got us into. <laughs> Come on. And then number four, prospering. Blessed are those who find wisdom, who gain understanding, for she, wisdom, is more profitable than silver and yields better returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. Listen to this. Long life is in her right hand. And in her left hand are riches and honor. Wisdom. Now, just in case you think you don't need this, I want them to put Luke 2.52 on the screen. And Jesus increased in... <laughs> so if Jesus increased in wisdom and he's Jesus, and we're actually trying to live like Jesus. So this is the kind of increase we're praying for this month. Lord, give me an increase of heavenly wisdom. Help me to unlearn so I can relearn. Give me the faith and the courage to trust your way because your way is not just right. Your way is better. Father, I pray for increase of heavenly wisdom. May all month long our heart be open to relearning your ways. May our question in this season not just be, is this right? May our question be, is this wise? I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Really quick, if you're here today and you've never sincerely... Family, I hope that word helped you. I hope it challenged you in a unique way. Here's what the Bible says. God's word doesn't return to him void. 
It accomplishes all he's sending out to do, and it prospers the thing wherein he sent it. You're gonna, your soul is gonna prosper because of God's word today. And listen, if this message has blessed you, I'm just gonna ask you to send it to someone else. And if your heart is so stirred to sow back into the field that you're harvesting from, to bless the ministry that is blessing you, then we invite you to do that as well. Thank you in advance for your generosity.